Give me money, give me money, give me money, give me money, give me money. Man, I'm getting a lot of content out of Rise of Skywalker. Actually, that's not true. I'm getting a lot of content out of crazy straight women who completely blew a fucking gasket over the basic realities of their shitty garbage men. Let's get meta, everyone. So, we've been talking a lot about toxic material lately. Be that a cartoon that reinforces harmful ideas about family and forgiveness, or a YouTube creator who preaches never questioning another person's beliefs, or a fandom ship that reinforces and romanticizes toxic and abusive relationships. And whenever I talk about these things, there is always always, always, some kind of package dismissal from the people who don't want others to have these discussions. Namely, that worrying about this kind of thing is pointless because it's all fiction and fiction doesn't affect the real world. Of course, those of you who know what art is probably laughed when I said that. This runs in parallel to the kind of people who loudly and endlessly praise a cartoon for being deep and so much more meaningful than regular kitty trash and then turn around and say, lol, it's just a kid show. When that cartoon's very deep and troublesome issues are brought to light, it's been a common thread among a great deal of fandom culture, but shippers in particular, to decry criticism of things like toxic pairings by claiming that fiction doesn't affect reality. That it's all harmless, and just because you like something in fiction doesn't reflect your views in reality. A sentiment that is as passionately stated as it is fucking nonsense. You've probably heard this most recently from the hobgoblins of the Raylo cult trying in vain to deny and talk over anyone who points out the very real reality that that their favorite ship is between the main character and an abusive, creepy, genocidal grease ball that they've attached themselves to for no other reason than a slavish devotion to the enemies to lovers trope and a weird, creepy hard on for Adam Driver. Incidentally, I find it hilarious that these greasy sci fi weebs are insisting that fiction doesn't affect reality while they're getting absolutely furious that Daisy Ridley sat beside John Boyega at the BAFTAs instead of Adam Driver. No, really, they did that. But chances are, if you hang around any other fandom, you'll probably find other pairings that tacitly ignore the very concept of basic human sensibilities, and then proceed to get defensive about fiction versus reality when they're called out. And just because I hate every single one of you and I want you all to suffer, I'm gonna read out a list of examples provided to me by my viewers who have seen some shit. <clears throat> from Invader Zim, an adult with a child. The Joker and Harley Quinn, a relationship that was openly written as abusive with the direct intention of it ending and never coming back. Elsa and Anna, two actual literal sisters for whom the joke of how Disney writes dialogue wore out after four days. Do you still like Ruby? Well, get ready to hate yourself because you have a racist and the girl he spends most of his time tormenting, a guy in the main villain who murdered his girlfriend, and a girl with her abusive and homicidal ex. Oh yeah, and the fandom also did the Frozen thing again. Pretty much everything from Sonic the Hedgehog when you remember that most of these characters are kids and or teenagers, and also when you remember what most of the Sonic fandom is like. Thor and Loki from the MCU, because it wasn't enough to have the Frozen thing and Raylo, someone just had to smash them together like a gross Play-Doh factory. Oh hey, and you know what else is popular? Tony and Peter. I'll give you a minute to finish having your existential crisis. Alistair, and literally anyone from Has Been Hotel, but most specifically with Charlie, because he has this kind of sinister ulterior motive thing going on, and apparently fandoms turn up their nose at canon ships that are actually cute and mutually supportive, in favor of the one that cannot possibly end well. Roxas and Axel from Kingdom Hearts, because Roxas is the same age as Sora, and Axel is in his 20s. Dipper and Mabel from Gravity Falls, a brother and sister pair, so it's the Frozen thing, except this time it's straight. That's even worse! <laughs> How is that worse? I don't know, but it's the same! From Harry Potter, oh boy, this is gonna be fun. A wealth of horrifying and cursed ships. We have Draco with Harry or Hermione, which is just horrible romanticizing of abuse, as well as Snape with Harry and Hermione, which is that times a thousand, and also have a seat over there, you asshole. And lastly, we have Lapis with anybody from Steven Universe for being abusive and toxic, as well as Lars and Sadie for the massive age gap, as well as the fact that Sadie's kind of a nut. That one actually was also canon for a while, because the show was made by someone who in the past has shipped quite a few of the things on this cursed list. Oh, also Pearl and Rose, because nothing says romance like a master and slave dynamic, apparently. So, do you hate your life for having that information now? Because I I sure do. I didn't even get into Friendship is Magic because I want to make you lose your faith in humanity, not actively damage your mental health. Seriously though, there are a lot of pedophiles, like so many pedophiles. Alright, jump into the cold pool. The problem with the sentiment that these kind of horrifying ships are harmless is that it fundamentally ignores and denies how art works. Art has always inspired the real world. 
art has always affected reality. Art has always influenced people. If art doesn't influence the world, why are all our phones basically tricorders now? Why are home assistants and smart home technology basically bringing the ship's computer into real life? Why are there people seriously working out the science behind a lightsaber? Actually, no, if art doesn't influence the real world, why did someone make an actual working lightsaber? If art doesn't influence the real world, why does every hack fuck with no literacy skills invoke 1984 and Animal Farm anytime someone even slightly suggests taxing the rich slightly more than they're currently being taxed? Why is the suppression of art a cornerstone of dystopian science fiction? Why do anarchists wear that stupid fucking mask? Why do religions exist at all? Or, and here we're getting into the big one, if art doesn't influence the real world, why are Star Wars fans such vitriolic, hateful fucking hobgoblins to real world people simply because they didn't like what happened in their fiction stories for children? Art has always influenced the real world because artists go out of their way to influence people. Nothing is ever just fiction. Everything inspires something, even if it wasn't intended. Do you really think Gene Roddenberry expected engineers to spend decades recreating the technology he put into Star Trek? The notion that fiction and reality are completely 100% separate from one another is so loud laughably boneheaded that it would almost be funny if it weren't for the fact that this isn't idiocy that causes this argument, it's delusion. At the end of the last video, I made the remark that much of this discourse is about protecting oneself, and that's ultimately where the brain rot truly lies. There is an epidemic of people who are progressive only until things get personal, who are invested so hard in the idea of themselves as a good person that they will become extremely distressed and panicked the moment that view of themselves is threatened. And when that self-image is threatened, it means that the person person asks uncomfortable questions about themselves and has to reevaluate their own positions and their own wokeness, so to speak. This is why we've seen so much of BreadTube steadily turn into progressives, alt-right apologists, and dirtbags because they're brushing up against the reality that they are not the final word and that they have things to learn and biases to examine. But because much of their identity is built around being the voice of the left on YouTube, when confronted with that reality, the majority of them shut down completely. Natalie Wynn made a career on transphobic jokes and set pieces presented as endearing self-deprecation, but the reality is that she isn't as progressive as she likes to think she is, and so when confronted with many of her outdated and fundamentalist beliefs and the way she surrounds herself with conservatives and centrists, what did she do? Double down and cry about cancel culture and how the only truly rational way to approach bigots is to never challenge them at all and hope they'll just magically change their views on their own, despite the fact that that's never how that works. A woman who has built much of her identity around converting the alt-right panics the moment she's faced with the reality that she is the one being converted, not the other way around. Here's another example, the castle doctrine. In this game, you play as a man trying to protect his family with security systems. If a robber gets to your house, your wife tries to escape with half your money, which means the robber has to kill her in order to get it. Meanwhile, you're out trying to do the same thing to other players. The game caught a lot of criticism because this is pretty archetypal sexism to reduce the only female presence in the game to a resource you have to murder to double your money. The excuse given by the developer was that the game was intended as a critique of toxic male culture, which is countered by the fact that this wasn't a critique, this was just being the thing. The developer then continue to explain constantly and remarking on the criticisms as confusion as if the people criticizing the game didn't get it. Now, I'm going to give you five seconds to figure out how to fix this problem. Figure it out? Here goes. The developer could have either A. Randomized the gender of the player and spouse or B, let the player choose both of those things. See, here's the thing. The complaint was ultimately about the implications of a very small portion of the game, an aspect of the game that was in fact so small that it wasn't a hill worth dying on. The solution was so simple and so easy that it could have been implemented within a week and pleased everybody, but it would have required something pretty big for a lot of people. It would have required conceding that there was a problem in the first place. For the developer to go, why did I automatically go for the husband doing the protecting, making the couple that represents the game mechanics heterosexual and make the spouse always be female. And that might risk the developer, and indeed everyone who plays the game, realizing that they have some biases to overcome and things to learn. And when most people do that, they instead have a crisis over the idea that they might not be a good person. Think back to Natalie Wynn for a minute. Most of what she gets in trouble for tends to be offhand remarks and very short clips and videos that rub people the wrong way. Hardly a hill worth dying on. And yet she gets so sanctimonious, so defensive, and so fucking histrionic over the 
idea of being criticized for them. Because it's not about Buck Angel or her sticking by her shitty opinions, it's about not wanting to have that conversation with herself about her very evident self-hatred and internalized transphobia. The human mind is a miracle, and you will never see it spring more beautifully into action than when it is fighting against evidence that it needs to change. Your psyche is equipped with layer after layer of defense mechanisms designed to shoot down anything that might keep things from staying exactly the way they are. This is why you see conservatives and centrists cry so much about cancel culture, despite the fact that people who get cancelled often very rarely suffer any real consequences for their behavior outside of the emotional stress of being shamed for that behavior. This is why you see performative socialists and centrists cry about woke scolding, because in the face of no real defense for your actions, the only recourse your brain has is to reach for an excuse not to listen to someone. Deflections, complaints about PC culture, tone policing, getting huffy that someone is abrasive, trying to prove that someone is a hypocrite, focusing on the messenger to avoid hearing the message, and actively contradicting things you already know to be true are all psychological traps your brain will bombard you with to keep you from acknowledging that there is a problem that needs to change. Let me go to something that isn't necessarily ideological. My ex-fiancé tried really hard to get me to drink alcohol. She tried to get me into drinking games, tried to get me to try different kinds of wine and cocktails, and she did not respond well when I told her that I don't drink. Now, I don't avoid alcohol for any principles about drugs, in fact I had a caffeine addiction for a very long time, but alcoholic beverages taste like piss to me. But my lack of drinking really bothered her to the point that she would openly complain about it. This really confused me until a few years later when I was in therapy as a result of that relationship, and my therapist explained to me that the reason she was so upset by that was because my refusal to drink while she was drinking made her feel like she was being judged, and that it wasn't anything to do with me, she was just battling with guilt over her own drinking habits and lashing out at anything that might cause her to question how much she drank and even consider if she might have a drinking problem. Chances are you'll see this with people who love, love, love marijuana. I've caught a lot of flack for treating marijuana like tobacco or alcohol. The, ben the medical benefits of marijuana are exaggerated by many people, and its habit-forming properties are often ignored. Whenever I point this out, I get screeds from people who want to convince me that marijuana is this mere drug that can fix anything. But I've never actually been against marijuana. I firmly believe that it should be legal because law enforcement wastes its time and resources chasing down slightly smellier cigarettes, and in the US, marijuana is literally just a scapegoat as an excuse to throw black people in prison by the boatloads. So I'm basically as pro-marijuana as a person can possibly get, yet people still get upset about this. Why? Because they're trying to keep themselves from asking the question, do I have a smoking problem? And I've met people who are clearly addicted to marijuana and are destroying themselves with it, yet they will go through any mental gymnastic possible to avoid admitting that there's a problem. You quickly learn that these kind of defensive screeds are not about trying to convince you. They're talking to themselves because they want to believe. And now we circle back to shipping, which is probably the worst for this particular defensive habit because it causes people to find ways to excuse things that should be objectively bad. Abuse, pedophilia, incest, unhealthy power dynamics, all things that are normalized in fandoms. Let's rip the bandage off right now. The reason people get so defensive and try to make so many excuses is because they don't want to admit that there is a problem within their own brain. Think about Raylo. Raylo is presented by its fans as a way to suggest that Rey has a responsibility to bring Kylo Ren back to the light and coax him through his issues. But this isn't just a quirky ship dynamic, this is how many people actually believe relationships work. Straight women are pressured to view themselves as their partner's therapist. It's not uncommon to see straight women remark on how much they have to be a caretaker to their partner and see nothing wrong with that. It's the sitcom stereotype of a wife who does all the housework, raises the kids and deals with the finances, while the husband lounges around watching TV and taking no active role in the adult responsibilities. And when pressured, many Raylos will often reveal that they view relationships as a caregiver dynamic. This isn't just fiction, this is how they actually view relationships. The romanticization of this kind of dynamic is a form of misogyny, and that's something that the mostly straight women who make up Raylos fanbase don't want to acknowledge. Nobody truly wants to accept the fact that they have internalized bigotry to work through. Oftentimes people can't accept that they have external bigotry to work through, but so often that denial causes issues like this, where a group of women can prove to be openly racist, misogynistic, and homophobic, and still believe that they're the ones being bullied. But the harsh truth of the situation is that if you can look at all of this... Detroit. We have what we need. You know I can take whatever I want. It's time to let old things die. You have no place in this story. You come from nothing. You're nothing. I'll destroy her. And you and not see this instantly to be abusive behavior? 
Well, I'm sorry, but you need therapy. This doesn't just apply to abusive ships that straight women fawn over. It applies to every gross ship dynamic. Adults and children, incest, abuse of power. These are all things that will say something about you if you passionately and consistently ship this kind of garbage. Going to bat for Beauty and the Beast and yammering on about how he changed his ways, despite those changes being token at best, is ultimately just a means of protecting yourself from asking that uncomfortable question about why you keep defending this kind of abuse of garbage. You are Belle. Your nose in a book as you ignore the real world around you and form your opinions based on the trashy romance novels you read all day. And you don't abandon those ideas when you take your nose out of that book, because you'll passionately defend people from the consequences of their own bad behavior on the basis of those trashy romance novel morals. The conversation killing question you will always hear from people when this discussion starts is, So am I a bad person for liking X ship despite its flaws? When someone asks that, they have ultimately revealed the real motivation for ignoring those elements in the first place. They have admitted to you that what they really care about is their own perception of themselves as a good person. Pointing out that these things are toxic has ultimately wounded their ego. And let's think about that seriously for a moment. For the people who might be inclined to ask that question, let's imagine that you watching this video right now are a hypothetical Raylo who is fully aware of the abuse and toxic behavior involved in this pairing, but you still ship it anyway. Here's my question. Why is none of that a deal breaker for you? We'll stay focused on Raylo for now because it's recent and still relevant, but you could expand this thought experiment to any toxic ship you might be interested in. How did you manage to get through all that garbage and still come out going, I ship it? Because that is the elephant in the room, that none of these things mattered enough to you to act as a deterrent. Simply acknowledging that something is toxic isn't where the conversation ends because we ultimately shift to the fact that you don't care enough to act on that acknowledgement. And if you're so wrapped up in this idea of yourself as a good person, that's a conversation that needs to be had. I can excuse racism, but I draw the line at animal cruelty. You can excuse racism. Because you didn't care about this stuff enough for it to get in the way of having your creepy fun. I know I'm fetishizing abuse, but I don't care. And expecting people to go away on that admission alone. Your admission of the ship as toxic wasn't enough to get you to stop romanticizing abuse, and that's the part that actually matters. It's similar to how when the Toon Critic scandal came out, and many of the perpetrator's closest friends had their support for abuse victims and denouncement of pedophilia come to a screeching halt once it meant actually inconveniencing themselves in some way. And these were all people who liked to imagine themselves to be good people. But when the time came to actually act like one, they couldn't be bothered. Instead, they harassed people and threatened litigation. The lesson here is that these things do in fact say something about you. Even if that thing is ultimately, I am a self-centered asshole who will not let hurting other people get in the way of my fun. Your interests, your likes and dislikes, how you act on those likes and dislikes, these are all things that say things about you. And if you truly are invested in being a good person, that means sometimes altering what you consume on that basis. And if you don't care about any of that, well, fine. There's not really much I can do there. But if what you want is the ability to consume problematic material and not only receive no personal criticism for it, but also to not have to see criticism of it in public because it makes you uncomfortable, well, you're not getting that. Nobody gets a consequence-free environment, especially not in public. Don't like that? Tough shit.